Okay, in this session we're going to be talking about polymers and getting you ready for the lab. So this is it's a little mini lecture. Now, <clears throat> when we look at injection molding for the polymers, a lot of times we use polymers and plastics interchangeable. We're going to be using a small desktop injection molding machine that looks much like this right here. We're going to use dies that are just like this right here where we're going to shoot the plastic. And so a lot of times you're going to hear the terms shoot or shot. This machine right here will do a one ounce shot of plastic. That's the material that will come out volume wise. One ounce. And now our parts are less than one ounce. And so we will shoot that plastic in here. And this is a cold well. So the first initial plastic will come down in here and stop and get hung up in here. The rest of the plastic will flow into these cavities, filling these up. And so this is a balanced mold where this is a gate right here that's going to have the rigging, which this little cross right here, plus sign, is going to be our rigging that allows the material to go through the runners into the gated areas. And this is the final part here. Now we're not going to use a yellow plastic. We're going to use some neutral colors and clear colored plastics for this lab. And so we would just recycle this or pitch this piece here in the trash can as we do with most plastics, unfortunately. Now, these dies have dowel pins that locate and hold them together, and we want to make sure we're using the match set. We have a couple of dies, and each of them are a match set for each other. We can't interchange the components from one die to the next. We're going to be able to set the temperature on here for the polymers. We're going to put our polymer in this little dish portion. We're going to have this rod that we can come down here, and we're going to press manually and making a hydraulic pressure for that fluid to go in here. This clamp right here turns and we're going to slide our die in here and line up the nozzle which is going to be on the bottom with this hole right here. And then we should be able to get our parts out. Now I just threw this little picture over here on the side because you can get what we call a mud die and mud stands for multi-unit die where I could have a housing and I could put inserts in there. So I could 3D print, and we have some stereolithography resin type printers now that have high temperature plastics that can hold up to the temperatures we're shooting in here. And if you were going to do a small run of 20, 100, maybe a few hundred parts, you could print a mold, put in this mud die. Now, we have mud dies on the bigger machines. We would machine these out of aluminum or some softer materials and put it in there. And, and that multi-unit die, we could put that in there and then mold our parts from that. So that is a neat way we can use 3D printing to make molds to shoot multiple parts rather quickly. Now what does an industrial machine look like? This is an industrial machine. This is a boy. That's the manufacturer, the brand. And the 50 represents the tonnage. The tonnage is how much force we can clamp and hold the two die halves together, and that's 50 tons. So let's talk about this tonnage and this clamp force. You're going to be putting pressure on the plastic, and typically that can range up to close to 2,000 PSI. So if you had a square inch, you would need 2,000 pounds, that would be a ton, of force to hold that together. So let's, let's memorize this here. One square inch is going to take about a ton of clamping pressure just to hold it together. So we're going to need a little extra to make turn, maintain the dies being closed and they don't open up and we have flashing at the parting line where the die halves come together. And we're going to talk about the parts of this machine and what goes on with these machines here. And this is just a, a more industrial grade type machine that we would see. Now let's talk about the plastics we're going to deal with. We need to first address thermoplastic versus thermoset. We're going to be working with thermoplastics, not thermoset. What's the difference here? I basically can heat, melt it, let it cool, and then remelt it, and this is a repeatable process. Now, each time I do that, I can have thermal degradation in the material. That's a thermoplastic. Thermoset, likewise, I can come over here and if I heat it up and mold that part, it is going to now make something much like this pancake. I can't melt this pancake down or a cookie. Those are basically linked and cross-linked parts. If you want to think of that way where we have these in noodles, we'll talk about these noodles. Over here we have the thermoplastic. A lot of times addition processes we're going to see long multiple chains and we just have intertwining of the chains holding them 
or van der Waal forces weak secondary bonds. Here we have this cross-linking, and this is by the time we try and put enough energy in to break these bonds up, we will actually destroy and char and uh, destroy that material. So when we think of polymers, we need some vocabulary here. And so you want to remember these as well. We have a mer. A mer is just going to be one unit structure. So look at this train over here. This is the Durango Silverton tra train. This is a great train to run, uh, get on and go from D Durango to Silverton. Great train. Uh, the Colorado Trail con uh, goes across this. I've actually came across here you can jump the train go up to town eat come back down and continue on your with a hike they always put you on the back of the train because you smell but one mer would be a rail car if i had two rail cars that would be a monomer if i had the whole train that's my polymer okay so many mers if you remember that Linear structure is real common with these materials where we can have long chains. And I, I know we've got some cheese on our macaroni and cheese here, but the noodles are fairly short. Here we have longer noodles, and we're going to see those secondary weak bonds and things, van der Waal forces taking effect, and maybe get different principles of, of properties coming from the length of those chains. So how we process that material temperature and pressure can change the length of these chains in this thermal thermoplastic that we're going to be dealing with and so entanglement they're going to entangle you pull one noodle sometimes it pulls others out uh, again all this is just quick review uh, in material science you're going to learn that there's lots of different kinds of chemical reactions can happen uh, a real common one with the plastics we're going to be dealing with is going to be addition where we just continually add more monomers on to make that polymer and so we just see a repeating chain at some length happening there now, some of the chains will have little defects like this. And so this is a benzene ring right here where we would take our monomer. Again, a lot of these, let's talk about this structure here. And, and I'm going to go back here. This is going to be like our polyethylene right here. We're going to have a carbon, a carbon, and some hydrogens off of here and then repeating. If I go to my polystyrene, which we're going to be molding, it is going to have a benzene ring. This is a large defect on the noodle, if you want to think about the molecule. Sorry about that. And what's going to happen is these are going to interlock with each other and not let them slide. So this is going to make it stronger, more rigid, more brittle. Okay, That's called chain stiffening. We can make the chains stiffen by putting this benzene ring on there. Now, cross-linking is a thermal set material. That's where we take part A, part B. You can think of epoxies like that. We mix them together, and they cross-link. And I just wanted to talk about that. Now, let's get back on track here with our thermoplastics. In thermoplastics, we can have two categories. We can have amorphous and crystalline. Okay, let's look at some properties here. And you need to remember these properties with what we're having here. I'm going to go over some of the highlights. Basically, amorphous, yeah, it's going to have a broad softening range where sharp melting temperature with crystalline. Crystalline means it's a repeating structure. It's going to be repeating. In some of our labs, we talked about metals having that body center cubic, face centered cubic structure. It's a repeating structure. That's a crystalline structure. Some plastics have that. Some plastics are amorphous, and there's no repeating structure. So due to that structure right here of the crystalline material, it is basically not going to let light pass through it as easy as maybe this amorphous, where this is a looser structure and light's going to pass. So if I want something clear to see through, I may want something that's an amorphous polymer versus a crystalline polymer. Shrinkage rate is going to change hugely to these two different polymers that we go on here with. Uh, as a matter of fact, the polystyrene is harder to get out of some of the molds than the polyethylene because the polyethylene we're going to find out is crystalline and it will shrink more and it comes out of the mold a lot easier. We have chemical resistance is going to change, fatigue resistance, all that kind of stuff is going to relate to the crystalline structure or the amorphous structures of that material. Let's look at this right here, amorphous material versus crystalline. I've listed some materials that are typically amorphous. We talked about polystyrene. That's what we're going to be dealing with. And it's abbreviated PS. So you kind of want to remember that polystyrene is PS. Uh, PVC, like our pipe, is PVC. That's polyvinyl chloride. I'm not going to make you remember the rest of these. This isn't the full materials course. But the fact is polystyrene is clear. 
Okay, so we could make a clear lens. Now polystyrene would not be the choice for safety glasses as it's not impact resistant. It breaks really easy as you're going to find out. Now over here on the crystalline side, milk jug material. We really can't see. If you drank all the milk out of there, you can't really see through the jug. It's not going to be as transparent. And that is going to be a PE material, polyethylene here. So its acronym is PE. Polypropylene is a polyophylline, just like this polyethylene. They're real similar. You can actually weld these plastics together really easy. And then there's other polymers down there as well. Now, if I look at light transmission, we understand that's tied to amorphous and crystalline materials. We have three terms here, transparent, translucent, and opaque. So if it's not going to let any pass, um, that's going to be our milk jug type material, our polyethylene material. If we're looking at transparent where the light goes through, that's probably going to be our polystyrene material. If I look at a flame test, sometimes we do this. Now, I don't recommend doing this um, unless you're in a vented area and you know what you're doing, but there is an ASTM test for determining polymers by how they burn. And so I can come in here and put a fire to it. And if I had polyethylene, my PE, and I've lit it a fire, the fire is going to look a lot like a candle right here. It's going to have a blue center yellow flame, and it's going to smell like a paraffin wax color or smell. So you've smelt birthday candles on your birthdays over the years, and you know that smell. You know what a candle looks like. And that would be real similar to polyethylene. So when we're in lab and the plastics are getting hotter, you might recognize, even at the elevated temperatures, a little tinge of paraffin in the air. Okay. Now then, some of our plastics, talking about that standard, they do have tests out there, and it describes what the burning characteristics are versus the smokes that are given off. Some plastics are known as self-extinguishing. That would be like PVC right here. Um, it, you, you remove the flame source, the fire on the plastic would actually go out due to the chlorine. Now that's going to put acidic gas out and it's not going to be good to have. That's why we don't like to do a laser cut on that. But our poly ethylene right here and polypropylenes, yeah, they're the paraffin wax colors. Our polystyrene, where is that one at? We're looking for polystyrene right here. It's going to be yellow and sooty. Oh my gosh, this is going to be like a settling gas when we light a torch. We're going to see that nice soot coming off and it's going to be a choking kind of smell. It's not going to be really good to, to, to inhale that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of our plastics we don't want to inhale. That's a whole nother topic on the effects of fires for firefighters and all that fun stuff and the toxic fumes, the materials that we make. But let's get back to this polyethylene here. Polyethylene is an addition type process where we can just keep adding MERS on and get a longer polymer by our process that we're going to do on there. Um, we do see some polyethylene, and I put this on here just to make you understand, It is not, we see some polyethylene in terms of PEX pipe. They've learned how to radiate it with radiation in a certain manner, and they can actually force that material to be cross-linked, and it's great for piping material. So yes, PEX pipe is polyethylene that has been cross-linked. So science has really changed this material. Now, we talked about polypropylene is real similar to polyethylene. The only thing we've done different in that is we've taken one of the hydrogens off and we put a MER unit on here, um, a methyl group, not a MER, sorry about that, a methyl group, a CH3, and that's going to change the structure a little bit. But they're carbons and hydrogens in different formats, and they're very compatible to each other. This is going to be a little bit stronger than polyethylene. So polystyrene, keeping on track here. Uh, polystyrene, we talked about that benzene ring going on here, and we can just keep adding those uh, monomers on to the molecule and making it longer and longer, and the, the molecular weight would go up. You guys did stuff like that in chemistry, calculate molecular weight of, of different structures. We know polystyrene is styrofoam, so we can foam this, and it's going to make a styrofoam. We know polystyrene, as a lot of our outside computer housings, things like that, is going to be a very brittle type and hard plastic okay so not very good for extrusion that's another topic for another day but um, it will not have good properties in terms of if we expose it to sun the bonds that these are held with are very close to the uv light spectrum that's coming through and it will tend to break it down in yellow fairly quick so let's get back to our resins here. We're going to be working with resins in the lab, and we're going to be dealing with granular virgin material. Now, 
if I was looking at grinding some of that up because we mentioned the runner systems and we'd normally pitch that some places will have a machine that's like a paper shredder and you throw it in there and it shreds all that plastic up or misrun parts and what we can do is come in there and mix maybe 30 or 20 percent of regrind with virgin material the reason we do that is if you just process 100 percent regrind material the properties will will fall down because every time we heat and process that plastic, the thermal history of that plastic allows for degradation of the polymer itself. So if we're wanting to get near properties of virgin material, we want to slowly integrate that regrind into the virgin materials. Okay. Now, another term that we have with polymers, and our polymers that we're going to work with are not susceptible to this but if we were dealing with polycarbonates or uh, nylons we would have to dry the resin material you, know, th you think of things like these beads and these little silica packs this absorbs moisture you could dry these out and then they would absorb more moisture we have industrial dryers that we run the polymers through before we injection mold or process them so hygroscopic deals with the absorbing aspect of the polymers now viscosity um, polymers we're going to be heating them up in some terms we have that we associate is what we call plasticizing we're going to soften that material so we're going to heat it up in some manner and it's going to soften and we're going to be able to process it one of the the definitions for polymers is something that's solid in its final state processed through flow all that fun stuff and so we're going to heat this up soften it and we're going to make it flow and so most polymer mills are non uh, Newtonian type fluids and so we're going to have this characteristic of the viscosity changing respect to temperature. So if we look at the viscosity versus temperature here we can see this is maybe some some nice caramel or something that we heated up if it got colder it's going to be a little thicker and they're going to have different flow characteristics on this and Likewise, the different polymers based on the temperatures are going to have different viscosities. And so we may have to heat them up more to get similar viscosities out of those materials to make them thinner. This is an injection molding machine. Now this is the industrial looking type machine. Ours is not going to have all these components and we're going to talk a little bit about the variances from an industrial machine to ours. Basically, we're going to have a hopper that we load the resin into. Our little machines have that little round disc on the top. We're going to feed the resin in there. And it's just going to fall into a barrel. There's no screw in that barrel. A true injection molding machine will have a reciprocating screw that turns. And basically, we're going to build a shot. We're going to see that there's a little valve up here in the front. It's not shown in this drawing. But we have heaters that heat up this different barrel at different zones so we call these zones so this would be zone one two three and then at the nozzle typically four when i buy that resin typically i would get the process sheet and they would tell me for that certain polymer like polyethylene set your zones at these temperatures and you're going to get optimum performance out of that material so those are established by the manufacturers of those resins now just because we're dealing with polyethylene we can do things like put glass in there 10 percent 20 percent glass and it's going to make it stronger and have different properties we can do a lot of additives in colorants to those materials to change them and their properties now once this screw goes around and builds a shot it's going to have a valve we'll talk about it and we're going to shoot the material into the mold through a nozzle so we'll have a little nozzle on the bottom of our machine we're going to shoot the material by pulling the lever down and we're going to shoot that material into the mold and so you get the feel, you get the sense that. If we just had an automated machine, you wouldn't get the feel and sense that. So the, how hard you guys pull on that, you can feel that. Um, we could do simple calculations of the pressures that we're applying on that, some really neat stuff. And you're going to put that polymer through the mold. It's going to be a two-part mold. And this machine has a big hydraulic cylinder on this one so that with the 2,000 pounds per square inch that we're applying on this, we can put a big seal on it here and keep those two dive halves together based on the surface area of that part. Okay, we've talked about some of that. Now, let's talk about this injection molding cycle. This is typically what we do, and you guys are going to be doing something similar in lab where you're going to come in and you're going to load some material into the screw. So we're probably going to feed some material in there. We're going to close the die halves. And then we're going to inject the plastic in there. Okay, so we're injection molding the plastic in there. And there's a term called packing pressure. 
what we're going to do is put a little extra material in there and when we squeeze it down we want to hold that for a little bit and pack that material into the cavity and what's going to happen is that cavity the material is going to solidify and shrink and if we put packing pressure on there we can actually control a little bit to some aspect the amount of shrinkage so if we don't put as much packing pressure it's going to shrink a lot more than if we pack it so we're going to pack that thing and then at a, as it gets to a certain temperature and it solidifies we can quit the packing pressure and then we can reciprocate now the screw which we don't have is going to reciprocate and build the next shot of material getting it ready as the part cools the rest of the way so we may want water cooling jackets and stuff in the dies because over time that die is going to heat up we don't have that on ours we're not going to get our dies that hot and we have aluminum dies and they cool off pretty quick now big production dies are going to be made out of tool steels and such so that they last longer but we're going to come back in and then repeat this cycle over and over and over and in lab you guys may need to shoot several shots of parts till you get some decent looking parts some of you may leave the plastic too long in the barrel and it heats up and degrades you'll notice that by co uh, massive color changes let's go ahead and shoot some other parts and eventually do that okay till we get some good parts and this is going to help you learn the injection molding cycle by actually doing it on a handheld machine now on an automated machine there are typically three zones and I would remember this typically we would have the hopper here dropping the resin in and it's going to hit the feed zone this is going to get the the material moving along in the screw as the screw turns through the flight the change in the the pitch the top up here and the, the the root the crest in the root of that thread then we're going to have it change the that flight depth and it's going to become smaller and that's going to start compressing that material it's going to build up heat at about a heat we're going to see that polymer get plasticized there and melt so a lot of times we call the second zone the compression or melt zone and then it's a liquid it's plasticized we're going to meter it and what we're going to do is then bring it out the end of the screw and that's where this comes in the, the polymer is going to come around this ring right here and come through here and go ahead of this retainer ring that's when and the screw is going to feed backwards with the pressure it builds up and that's why we call it a reciprocating screw once we get the shot size we know this screw moved back so far what we're going to do is be able to advance the screw push on it and when we push this little check seat right here is going to hit this check ring right here and seal off and that's how we're going to build that hydraulic pressure and shoot that plastic into the mold so you can kind of see over here the pictures of building a shot injecting it and then coming back and doing it again and we would always leave a little bit of plastic there to apply that packing pressure we talked about now you guys are dealing with a two plate type mold not as complex as a industrial type mold where we have our nozzle and the plastic is going to go through there through the runner system we talked about into the cavities and then we're going to have our gates the gates control the flow of the material at a certain rate into there and there's a whole lot of technology in terms of edge gates summering gates um, ring gates and how we let those materials go in there a polymers course in injection molding and die design is in part design is really really a neat uh class to take I've taught some of those in the past where we actually use SolidWorks and we'll actually learn all the cool design techniques of designing parts designing the molds doing simulations on the injections so that we don't spend all that money and making the expensive dies we can simulate it modify the changes on the parts make it more manufacturable and then we can go make those dies now in this die they have what they call ejector pins and we would have a plate that would shoot these little pins out on selective parts of the piece to get it out of the die now in that die we typically have draft angles so the part will release and that's what ours is going to do so the sidewalls of the parts are not perfectly vertical or flat they're going to have some taper to it in terms of what we call draft and draft is important so that we can let the part come out of the mold correctly so since we don't have ejector pins we're going to have a little more aggressive draft on our part now the last slide that we're going to talk about here is going to be the shrinkage of the material when I shoot the part into a die, so this blue part is my die, and I shoot it in there, and again, we talked about I can change some of that a little bit by how much I pack it, but it's still going to tend to shrink. And basically, we could do testing, and we might find that these are typical shrinkage rates for various materials. So let's look at high-density polyethylene that we're going to deal with. That has a lot of shrinkage. Look at our polystyrene. Not much shrinkage. Again go back in the lecture which one is crystalline and which one is amorphous okay though 
the amount of shrinkage. We talked about that. Now, how could we relate this to part design? If I'm going to make a die and I'm going to shoot polystyrene and I'm going to shoot polyethylene and I want to hold a tight tolerance and I'm going to get different shrink rates, if I make the die and I design it for polystyrene, it may not work for polyethylene and hold the same tolerance and the same dimensions due to that shrinkage factor. So I would have to look at that, and if they're really a huge difference in the shrink factors, I may actually have to make two different dies with the shrink factors figured into oversizing the dies so when the part shrinks, it comes to size. The other thing I want you to think about the shrink factor is, I put this little picture on here, is if I have a thick section, and you guys are going to have some parts that you can see through. Guess what? That's our polystyrene, visible. It's transparent. You're probably going to see little air bubbles within that part. Look at the section and the, the flat sections where we're going to grab it with the templin grips and the tinsel grip. And you're probably going to see in those sections, because there's more mass there, you're going to see little voids internally. Now, in there could be some of those voids in the polyethylene version, but since we can't see that, we may not be able to see it. So normally when we make a part, we want to cut it and look for voids and things like that. And if we can reduce the wall thicknesses and maintain them and put ribs and things like that on there, maybe we can not have those internal shrinkages because that could weaken the part prematurely. Just wanted to throw that in. So at this point, we're done with this lecture. You're probably going to have a little lecture on using the lab equipment and how to use that and mold your parts and do a little bit of a tinsel test. Hope this helps out.